This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. My name is Pastor Dan, and we gather today as the people of Good Shepherd United Methodist Church in Oconomowoc, Wisconsin. One of the best ways for us to begin our worship is to begin in song. Today we begin with, I could sing of your love. Let us worship. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs through love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down, yeah. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love forever. Over the mountains and the sea, your river runs to love for me, and I will open up my heart and let the healer set me free. I'm happy to be in the truth, and I will daily lift my hands, for I will always sing of when your love came down, yeah. I could sing of your love forever. 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 I feel like dancing. It's foolishness, I know. But when the world has seen the light, they will dance with joy like we're dancing now. I could sing of your love forever. I could sing of your love forever. Sing of your love forever. I can sing of your love Today's scripture comes from John chapter 11. It's the story of the resurrection of Lazarus. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. When she had heard this, she went back and called her sister Mary and told her her privately, The teacher is here, and he is calling for you. When Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. 
Then again, Jesus, greatly disturbed, came from the tomb. It was a cave and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. But they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Let us pray. Holy One, we ask that you come, that you move among us, that you touch us. That may be in the words that we hear, that may be in the thoughts that we form, that may be in one of many ways. Move among us, touch us. This is our prayer. Amen. In recent times, there's been a strong movement that death is natural. And one of the first to uh, study death as a scientist was Elizabeth Kubler-Ross. In the 1960s, she analyzed the process of dying, and she came up with five identifiable uh, steps and uh, described each one of those steps and gave them a name. And that helps. It makes death seem more natural. And the more natural it seems, the easier it is to accept. I mean, the, the thinking is, if it's natural, why are we afraid of it? Only it doesn't work that way. I might be able to say about someone else's dying, that was a natural thing. But I don't see it that way with my own death and with a lot of death. It may be natural, but I don't see it as right. John Killinger writes of a woman who's approaching the end, and she says, I'm ready to go, but I am not ready to leave. She's a woman of faith. She's prepared herself with the promise of the gospel. She is ready to go, but she also knows it is not right. She wants to live. She doesn't want to leave. And sometimes people ask me questions about death. Most of those I can't answer. I'm not sure anyone can. All I can say is, all people must die. That's a fact. But that's not enough. We want to know why. Why must I die? Why must the ones I love die? Why? And the truth is, I don't know. I know I'm supposed to be an expert on these sorts of matters, but I just don't know. Over time, our batteries wear out kind of like the battery in my lap, or our bodies wear out kind of like the battery in my laptop computer. My laptop computer, I can plug it in and recharge it and use it again, but after a while, it just won't hold a charge. And finally, one day, that battery won't work anymore. Now, of course, in my laptop computer, I can replace that battery. But we can't replace our bodies. We can do amazing things with medicine, but eventually our bodies wear out. That's what makes this story of Lazarus such an important story about the life, about our life of faith. Lazarus is the brother of Mary and Martha. And in other gospel stories, we learn that Jesus visits their home several times. Remember the story, Mary sitting at Jesus' feet while Martha is in the kitchen preparing a meal. She's upset because Mary's not helping her. It's that Mary and that Martha and their brother, Lazarus. The, the sisters send word to Jesus that Lazarus, their brother, is dying. Surely you will come, Jesus. Come immediately. And Jesus responds with words that seem cold to me. He, he says, it's God's will that Lazarus should die so the Son of Man can be glorified. Now, we have the advantage of history. We can look back and we know that because Lazarus died, Jesus could perform a miracle and bring him back to life. So we can say that's why he said that. But sometimes I wonder if Jesus really said that. 
But this, this story is preserved because it answers a question that the church asked even in its earliest days. The question it answered was, where were you, Jesus? Why didn't you answer my prayers? Why did my loved one have to die? Look at the story. The two sisters send a message to Jesus. This is the one you love, Jesus. This is your friend, Lazarus. Surely you will come for him. He doesn't, though. To those who pray and wait, to those who hope and keep vigil, to those who say, let this pass, this cup pass from me. Sometimes he just doesn't come. And I don't think the reason for his not coming is important. What matters is that we prayed to Jesus and he didn't come. Why? I've been there. I think you have too. John says that Jesus waits two days and then heads for Bethany. And you wonder, what was he doing for those two days? What was so important? Martha hears he's coming and runs down the road to meet him. And she reprimands him. If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then she says, even now you can do something. For whatever you ask from God, God will give to you. And Jesus says to her, you will, your brother will rise again. And then comes the sign. Jesus reveals who he is and why he has come. Not just to Bethany, but why he has come to the world. I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. That's the revelation of this story. That's what John wants us to hear. John says that resurrection is not just something that comes at the end of the life. It's a possibility for us now, today. We can receive new life now. We don't have to wait for death to be resurrected. Eternal life can begin today. I'm fascinated with the story beneath the surface. The older story. If you remove the story where Jesus says Lazarus must die, die where, uh, so that the Son of God can be glorified, and, and the part that says, I am the resurrection. If you, if you remove all of that, what you have Jesus, or Martha saying to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And then Mary comes right along on her sister's heel, she, heels. She too chides Jesus, saying the same thing that Martha said. If you had been here, our brother would not have died. It's as if the original story was there to make a point. Why isn't Jesus there when we need him? I've asked that question. Many faithful people ask that when there is no answer to their prayers. Where were you, Jesus? Where were you? And how does Jesus respond to the two sisters. He asks them, where have you laid him? And then comes this strange verse. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. Jesus wept. And I want to suggest that this shortest verse in the Bible could be one of the deepest and most profound verses. I think those two words, Jesus wept, tell us so much about Jesus. He wept for Lazarus. He wept for Mary and Martha. He weeps for all who pray, come, Lord Jesus, and nothing happens. He weeps for those who have questions, hard questions, those who know that death is not natural. And sometimes it's just not right. It's the shortest verse in the Bible. And I think for me, when my time comes for me to go and I am not ready to leave, I need only this verse that reveals that when we die, Jesus weeps. That helps. It won't answer my questions. It won't get me out of my mortality. But I will know this. Jesus knows me. Jesus knows you. Do you notice that in this story, as Jesus gets closer to Lazarus' tomb, the less he talks. I wonder if it's because you can't talk and hold back your emotions at the same time. He gives a speech out there on the road. Uh, 
before he gets to town. And when he comes to Mary at the house, all he can say is, where have you laid him? And when he gets to the tomb, he weeps. It's amazing to me. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is always pictured as this uh, divine figure, this figure who's in charge, this one who's in, in control. He's, he's triumphant everywhere in John except here. This is the only place in John where Jesus is not in charge and triumphant. Even when the question is later asked of Jesus, who are you? Jesus responds as a redeemer, triumphant. He's divine. And when the question is, where are you? If you had been here, then our brother would not have died. Then Jesus is our friend. Now, of course, the story doesn't end here. Lazarus is ordered out of the tomb and he comes out. He's resurrected. And that's when we remember these words that Jesus said to Martha. I am the resurrection and the life. And whoever believes in me will not die. The miracle is a sign because it reveals who Jesus is and what he has come to bring us, the resurrection and the life. But it doesn't just remain some abstract proclamation. This story brings it home to us personally. Jesus calls Lazarus from his tomb and then he heads to Jerusalem for his own tomb. The tomb that held Lazarus is remarkably similar to the one that will hold Jesus. They're both in the suburbs of Jerusalem. They're both in caves. And in both stories, the stone is rolled away. Jesus' tomb is ours. And he says, because I live, you shall live also. Death remains a part of life. Like Lazarus, we will all die. But just because death is natural, I don't find any meaning or comfort in that. I find meaning and comfort in the promise of the gospel that like Lazarus, Like so many who have gone before us, we shall live again. We began today with a a question, and we end with a mystery. Jesus' resurrection is not, is a mystery. And mysteries don't answer questions. But biblical mysteries create new situations in which the questions no longer matter. Jesus wept. Thanks be to God. Amen. Will you come and follow me if I but call your name? Will you go where you don't know? never be the same. Will you let my love be shown? Will you let my name be known? Will you let my life be grown in you? Summons echoes true when you but call my name. Let me turn and follow you and never be the same. In your company I'll go where your love and footsteps show. Thus I'll move and live and grow in you. Today we mark Mother's Day, and as we move into this time of prayer, uh, I wanted to begin our time of prayer with this prayer for mothers. So join with me in this prayer. Gracious God, we give you thanks for our mothers, for those who have given us life and love. 
May we show them reverence and love. Gracious God, for our mothers who have lost a child through death, may their faith bring them hope. May their family and friends support and console them. Gracious God, we remember women who, even though they have no children of their own, are like mothers to us. They have nurtured and cared for us. Loving God, as a mother gives life and nourishment to her children, so you watch over us, your church. Bless these women that they may be strengthened as Christian mothers. Let the example of their faith and love shine forth and grant that we, their children, may honor them always with a spirit of profound respect. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we continue in our time of prayer, I have several uh, prayer requests that I pass along to you that you may include uh, these people from our church family in your prayers. Uh, prayers, continued prayers for Kelly Bratz. Uh, she had surgery on Wednesday, and we uh, want to continue to pray for her as she recovers from that. Also prayers for Myrene Lewandowski uh, as she continues, and uh, as she says, continues on her hospice journey. So prayers for Myrene. And also prayers for Leroy Reed. He had some uh, surgery last week, ended up back in the hospital over the weekend, but he is home and recovering there. So we remember Leroy and his family in our prayers. I'm going to lead us in a pastoral prayer. Then I will invite you to join with me, and together we will pray the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Gracious God, Long ago, faithful women proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and the world was changed forever. Teach us to keep faith with them, that our witness may be as bold, our love as deep, and our faith as true. Holy One, you have called us to follow in the way of your risen Son and to care for those who are our companions along that way, our friends, not only with words of comfort, but also with acts of love. Seeking to be true friends of all, we offer prayers on behalf of our friends, our church, and our world. Today we remember Kelly, Myrene, Leroy, and those others that we hold in the quiet of our heart. Guide us in the path of discipleship so that as you have blessed us, we may be a blessing for others, bringing the promise of your kingdom near by our words and our deeds. We close our time of prayer by praying together as we have been taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, as we prepare to leave this time of worship and to go out into the world, go out to share the great good news of God's love for us, for us all. Go out with these words of blessing. Go out in joy. Go out in faithfulness. Remain in Christ's love. Go out in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. See you soon. <laughs> See the glory of
Prepare.